big. That's what she said. Oh, that's so great. After 4 p.m. After 4 p.m. <laughs> all right, guys, this is the panel you've all been waiting for. Uh, it is about a little show called Critical Role. Have you heard of it? <laughs> so some of you have heard of it. That's good. That's cool. All right, so joining us, two of the stars and the Dungeon Master himself, Mr. Matthew Mercer. <laughs> And the lovely Marisha Ray. And joining me is this glass of Shiraz. <laughs> Yay, Shiraz! I guess true. <laughs> Alright guys, we're gonna start, just dive right into it. There is gonna be time at the end for you guys to ask your questions, so get them, like figure them out in your head, hold on to them. That's alright. Okay, so do you guys remember your first ever D&D character? I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Tell I us do. about it. Uh, my first ever D&D character was actually with this guy. Um, he was my first dungeon master. When you go Matt Mercer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sure. All that. <laughs> um, so I had never played before because I grew up in a small town in Kentucky where um, Dungeons and Dragons was a, a ritual cult or it's something. It's the devil! It's the devil! And um, so I came out to Los Angeles and he ran a one shot for me and I made uh, like a controller ranger who, it was fourth edition and she had it, she was like a ranger that would cast control spells, like, yeah, on her, yeah. I think she was a drow, too, yeah. She was a drow, yeah. yeah. Drow, ranger, controller, caster. It was cool, so I would, like, uh, I had bats. I had a lot of bats. I would make AoEs filled with bats. That's what I remember. Bats. 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 <laughs> My first character was uh, less cool. I, uh, I'd been brought into a second edition D&D game in high school, and uh, they're like, you can play whatever you want. I'm like, well, I want to be a wizard. Oh, but I want to be like a Gandalf wizard that uses a sword. How can I do that? Well, there's this militant wizard kid. I'm like, oh, cool, I'll use that. And as such, I made a wizard that wasn't as good at magic and was really terrible with a sword. <laughs> so uh, he didn't last very long. His name was Emeritus Trent, named after the Xanth character. And uh, it was a terrible, terrible character. But you learn from your mistakes. And to this day, he has a special place in my heart to not make a wizard that uses swords. So we all know Critical Role for what it has become now, but where did it start? What was the first thing that sort of brought this show to us? Well, before it was a show, it was just our home game for about two years, a little over two years, where, um, and I have been running different campaigns for years off and on, and Liam O'Brien had loved D&D when he was a kid, but hadn't played in many, many, many years, and i have been threatening all through the time we were working on Resident Evil together, saying, hey man, you want to play D&D? Let me know. And so finally, as part of like a birthday celebration, he was like, all right, go ahead and run a game. We'll bring some people over. And that's where we uh, brought Talison in, dragged Laura, Travis, and Sam, uh, who had never, ever played before. Most of the players who came in had never played. And so we, we began just running a home game from that one shot, and it turned into a campaign that was ongoing. I actually didn't play that first game because no one else had played. So I was there as like assistant coach, like assistant to the dungeon master. Yeah, so I just kind of went around and would help the characters. I, I basically just pointed to their stat sheets whenever they were confused on what to roll. I'd be Can like you that. come to my place and just do that? Yeah, I'm <laughs> just pointing over I people's shoulders. Where's like my damage, right? Right, right yeah, there. you're essentially Microsoft Word's Clippy. I was totally Clippy. I was totally Clippy. It looks like you have a strength bonus right there. Um, Don't but, forget your advantage. <laughs> exactly. But we, uh, we we just played on our own for two years, and then Word kind of got around in the industry about a bunch of voice actors playing D and D, and people were like, ah, "That sounds really nerdy," and we're like, "Damn right." And then eventually Felicia Day contacted us uh, through Ashley Johnson and got in a conversation. And she was like, "Hey, you guys ever thought about?" making this into a show, and we're like, no, no, that sounds like a terrible idea. No one would watch that yeah. show. Yeah, and then eventually we were like, well, we'll give it a shot and see if it works out, and, um, well, we're all here now. So that worked out. Yeah, we, we gave ourselves a promise that if we hated it after six weeks, and if it didn't take off, that we would just quit and go back to playing at home. We were like, no, no harm, no foul. 
Um, we, weren't, we aren't losing anything, really. And uh, needless to say, that decision was not made, yeah. which I am very glad it was not made. Now we have CG video of Sam shooting a lightning bolt out of his truck. That's fun. <laughs> it's funny how things work out. So how has the game changed since when it was just your home game to now being like live streamed to over 20,000 people at any given minute? Uh, not, not a whole lot. I mean, we, part of our stipulation for making it a show is that we didn't want it to change. And um, we were actually in pre-production for like six to eight months with Geek and Sundry because they were in the same camp that we were in where they thought there's no way anyone is going to want to sit down and watch people play Dungeons and Dragons for four hours. Um, so they kept trying to make it more visual. So like one of the original ideas is that we would play to a certain point in the campaign and they would, we would stop and then we would all jump on computers into an MMO like World of Warcraft and then beat the boss in the MMO and we were like, you don't know how Dungeons and Dragons work. That no. So yeah. it, it didn't... Luckily, it didn't go that way. But. Yeah, we, we, had, we had a while figuring out how the, how the show would work. So we, uh, we kind of decided we were just going to leave it up there, blemishes and all. All of its awkward stumbling and us messing with the rules. And, and it's essentially just our game with cameras available. And uh, I, like the, it worked. It actually, the benefits are, one, we're not waiting in between games for six weeks. We only have a week so we can retain information a lot more. And since we're on camera, I kind of actually cut away from the like side table chatter, you know, that you have in a lot of your games where if one person's distracted with something, then you're like, yeah, so hey, bro, how's uh, how's work going? It sucks. My car broke down last week. We're supposed to get it fixed. Uh, oh, really? I'm only so, oh okay. is it me? Oh, sorry. Wait, what yeah, happened? Uh, yeah. So it kind of cut down on a lot of that, which was good. So if anything, we're almost more engaged. Yeah, that's cool. So. Obviously, you guys didn't expect it to be the runaway success that it has become, but your fans are incredible. I mean, they create fan art and cosplay. And they're so engaged. And what's it like for you guys, especially like seeing someone, I know Matt used to be a cosplayer, seeing someone dressed up in costume as the characters that you guys are creating. What's that like for you? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's crazy. We're all crazy. It's so awesome. I, it's seriously, it's... There are no words. I don't, I don't know, man. You know, for, for, if I told you how many times we've like just read the response letters we've gotten from fans and the heartfelt emails and, and just breaking down into tears with the idea that people out there are so uh, either touched by our silly little game or have gone on and made their own home games and some of those pictures of their friends getting together home games and playing and how much it's affected their life and changed their life that they've created their own worlds and like that's really the most I could have ever hoped to create with this you know show with all of us so it's it's forever overwhelming and, and we'll say repeatedly that critical role is it's not just the show we don't we don't when we say critical role we're not talking about a stream that airs from you know seven to ten on Thursday nights. We're talking about the fan art and about the community because if it wasn't for the fan art, it, we would not we wouldn't have visuals. You know, so the fan art actually really does add so much yeah. more and, to and, the show. And, and when we say fan art, I mean that includes like we have a lot of wonderful Poems musicians and that write songs and music based on their inspiration from the show. We have wonderful writers that, that, that write a lot of really awesome fan fiction side stories within the world they create on their own. Uh, and then we have a bunch it's of like people. It's all so good. It's all so good. And like all these people find different crafts and different things that they're good at and find a way to take the inspiration and funnel it that way and create something really cool and unique. And so it, we're just constantly beside ourselves and don't know how we ever got so lucky to be even remotely involved in this wonderful chaos. Can we get like a show of hands if you've ever made Critical Role fan art or cosplay or written something <laughs> or engaged with the Critical Role community? See? Oh, that's see, so look at how many. many. And that, that, that's crazy. Yeah, it, it accounts for like 50% of what we are, for sure. And that's uh, awesome. Yeah, we're, we're just always so humbled and I don't, I don't know, not to like go Keyleth on everybody here for a minute, but like we're not heroes, you know, we're not special, we're just people, and uh, so just that... You totally went Keyleth. I did, we're not, we're not. Um, so just to have 
anybody to say that like we've moved them or affected them. It's just like I don't know, I'm gonna stop talking about it so I don't start crying on stage. <laughs> just drink. <laughs> I drink. So Matt, the question that I think every DM in the room wants to know is how do you prepare for a session? So how do you get that ready? What's uh, the process? Okay, so it changes based on, on the story elements and what's happening, but I generally try and try and foresee possible directions the party may go based on what happened in the last game. So I'll uh, consider those paths. Uh, like I thought, maybe, maybe they'll go and this one story lead I left them a while back, they'll pursue that this direction, so I'll flesh out this path and whatever NPCs they may come across and possible encounters they may uh, circumvent or go head on into. And I'll prepare that from multiple different avenues. And I, I, don't, I don't flesh it out too crazy because most of that was gonna go out the window the moment you play anyway, because never the players do the most random shit ever and you have no control anymore. Cows. <laughs> So, Proudest moment. So I, I, I usually, I, I break it down in like a Word document and I'll, I'll have bullet points with major important points of information. Like if an NPC knows certain key elements of a conversation they try and draw out, I'll have notes on what, what they know and what the players could find out if they ask the right questions. Um, so it's pretty loose, so I don't feel like I put too much effort to have something never come to light if it doesn't get used. And if it does happen, a lot of the conversations still improvise and I just use those bullet points as points of reference as they emerge. Um, a lot of people ask your improv NPCs. Give a give a quick list of your improv unexpected NPCs. Oh, I, Victor. Uh, Victor. Uh, Victor was wasn't expected. No, there's, there's a lot of them. Kynan wasn't expected, right? Uh, uh, was, no, wait, no, Kynan was. Kynan I prepared a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of there's them. There's so many that you weren't uh, expecting. Yeah, I mean, technically... Oh, there's it's too many to list right now. I was kind of kind of off guard with that one. You can't be off guard with that one. Um, yeah, because there were the ones that were improvised when they first happened, but then I then fleshed them out once they were created, too. So, it, you know, it's hard to really remember which one started that way unless I go through a list to consider it. It's okay, just put me in the spot, it's fine. <laughs> Matthew Mercer will remember this. Shut up, Telltale, shut up. <laughs> so, what's the most unexpected curveball that the players have thrown you? Cows is pretty crazy. Uh, we had, we Someone had... has to fill me in on the cows thing. All right, so uh, long story short, they were they were briefly given the task to help this farming community outside of the main city, who had been losing livestock. They had just gone missing, and there have been you know rumors of some large creature snatching them away in the middle of the night. So the party decides to go and infiltrate this cattle field by masquerading as cows through illusion magic and then try and interrogate the cows for information. <laughs> cows, even if you can speak to them through magic means, aren't the best conversationalists, nor really take in the information around them. So she talks to one of the cows and is like, so what have you seen? Cows like, grass. Grass. <laughs> Big bird. Pooping. Yeah. You know, like, not a lot going on inside the cow's head. And then suddenly this giant bird, a rock, comes swooping in and snatches one of the players up, thinking it's one of the cow, and takes off into the night, and so the rest of them, to give chase, have to use a, fl a fly spell. So now all of a sudden you have this giant squadron of flying cows coasting over the night sky after this giant bird. And, uh, and thus the fan art rolled in after the evening of this, this wonderful moment. Um, so that was definitely a, a strange curveball. Um, I mean, having- I think, we, I think the hashtag Vox Mukina started happening yeah, after that. Happened. Yeah, that was yeah. good. Uh, there was a whole sequence where they went to the temple of, uh, of uh, the Raven Queen to retrieve this artifact, and the artifact at the end was trapped. And after this big battle with the Beholder, everyone was like, Oh, thank God that was cool. Let's go see what loot there is. No one checked for traps. Uh, Talison's scared to Percy, grabs it, sets it off, avoids it himself, but it hits Laura's character. She fails her saving throw, and it kills her outright. She's just dead. And so... They end up trying to resurrect her. They go through the ritual, and as part of the ritual, her, uh, Liam's character, who's her twin brother, basically prays to the Raven Queen in an angry way, saying, take me instead of her. And unknowing kind of started this path of joining in a pact with the Raven Queen. I, none of that was planned. 
none of this was expected, and now suddenly this entire character story has completely changed based on this one improvised character moment, and uh, it's pretty much defined. Based on this story. one. Up yeah, this one, that one bad role that Laura made completely altered the trajectory of this we character's story. I remember we were all so angry at ourselves after that because we were like, "Man, that was like some level one mistakes right there." <laughs> like, can't believe we did that, and we want everyone wonders why we're so paranoid. God, were you guys taking so long to talk about these plants because people die? This is real life. Go with it. <laughs> So now that I think we're, we're getting pretty deep into, into the fandom, I think you can ask this question. This is one of the many, many questions submitted on Twitter. And this one is, uh, if Gilmore owned a business present day, what would it be and would it be a dance club? <laughs> I, I think one of his many businesses in modern day would probably be a delightful dance club. That, I mean, hell, I'd freak with that I'd dance floor. I'd go club. there, hell yeah. Gilmore's Glorious Dance Floor? Yeah. Gilmore's Glorious Grooves? <laughs> there it is. It's like, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> That's right, shake that money maker. <laughs> yeah, uh, other than that, it'd be, he would probably buy out the men's warehouse and make it so much more fabulous. I think business suits and everything would be, everything would be rhinestones and glitter would be marvelous. You're gonna like the way you look. I guarantee I'm it. gonna like the way you look. Yeah. Everyone's gonna like the way you look. Trust me. I know what I'm talking about. Okay. So now that we've experienced that, <laughs> bring it back a little bit. Uh, tell us more about you, your background sort of in tabletop gaming. So where did it all start for you and, and what sort of encouraged this love of, of gaming really? I kind of briefly mentioned it before, but he was my first DM. And then I, um, that was just a one shot. And then I was, I was hooked from there on out. I, I think I had an adrenaline high for like the rest of the evening after that game. And then um, from there on out, I sought out my own games and I ended up doing like a, a, Buffy, a Buffy the Vampire tabletop RPG for a while which was great. Um, a few other like kind of like shorter campaigns, little one shots and then came back around for the game before this one uh, which was with you and yeah. Taliesin. Uh, Taliesin uh, yeah yeah a few other people. Um, and then that was our long running game for about a ye well years, for two, two years. years and then from there jumped into this game. You're, uh, that's a deeper question for you. I started way back before there was time in deserts <laughs> in the ancient dark days of 1997. <gasps> <gasps> that's it. Okay, I was waiting for more. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was in high school. I was invited to be part of a game, and I was excited, and I made a terrible sword-wielding wizard we talked about. And uh, we played for a few months, and I realized very quickly that the dungeon master who was running the game it was really frustrating, and was playing more for his own personal empowerment and power trip type circumstance, and trying to tell a good story and a narrative. And so I got frustrated and stopped playing that game and started dungeon mastering my own. And that was kind of where my real path of game running started. I've played in many games since, many good friends I still talk to and occasionally game with to this day, but uh, that, that was definitely where it all started. That's awesome. So a good D&D &D group is hard to get right. As you mentioned, like some DMs can be super controlling and some people just aren't great in a team. Yeah. So I think a lot of that also stems from communication when you start, before you start playing, too. Sometimes if people aren't clear about what kind of game it's going to be when you get into it, you start this discovering till it's too late that everyone had different ideas and expectations of it. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think I think that can be avoided for the most part as that communication actually happens, but it still happens. It's hard to avoid. Yeah, so my question was going to be, uh, do you have any advice for anyone who might be starting their first game? If you're starting your first game or you haven't played before, um, it's okay to be nervous. I still am before every game we play, regardless. Um, 
but you know, you have to, you learn over time to go ahead and just kind of let go and get into the story and have fun. Doesn't mean you have to do crazy voices like we do. We're insane people, and that's what we do for a living. Um, you know, you find your comfort zone, and and if someone is new to your game and they're being a little shy, let them be. Give them opportunities and try and elevate them and give them the spotlight occasionally. If you have that one player in your game, you know that usually takes the spotlight and stands up and kind of overshadows the rest. Perhaps talk to them and let them calm down a little bit and let somebody else step in and you know be in that light as well. But um, if you're just starting, definitely um, take the time to build a character personality that you would be comfortable playing for an extended period of time. You know, it could be something that's opposite from you that you want. If you're kind of a meek person, you can try and pick something that's more strong and bombastic in hopes that maybe that'll help pull you out of that shell a little bit. Um, Conversely, you can pick someone who's comfortable first as well. Just make sure that when you have a character uh, that you've developed, uh, you have a clear enough idea of how you want to play it so that when the opportunity arises, you don't feel, uh, for lack of a better term, you, you, you lack... Trapped? Well, <laughs> maybe. I'll say uh, you, you lack the, the drive and the will to, to step out and make those character moments happen. A lot of D&D &D is give and take in an improv environment with the other players. And if you have a lot of experienced people around you, it's hard to find a place to jump in. Other people are used to like, you know, seizing the moment, and you know, if, if, if you wait too long, you'll miss that opportunity. And that just comes with experience. Don't be afraid to kind of leap out and take, take a moment to, to say something, to shake the story up, and, and uh, show the rest of the party that you have something to offer beyond just additional damage in the occasional combat circumstance. Yeah, I think to kind of go off of that point, um, know that the game won't wait for you. So if you want to say something, you have to make it. You have to make it be known. I mean, and, there, and there's been a few times. I'm sure you guys have all noticed most of them when something might happen, and one of us will have an idea or want to try and say something, and then a moment will come in and take it off in another direction, and then it's gone. And and you have to let it go. I mean, it, it, once again, it's just like life that happens sometimes. Um, but don't be afraid to, if you want to say something, that you jump on it immediately. Um, and I'd say, I, I actually get asked a lot uh, from my fellow ladies, um, any advice from, or women who want to jump into the genre. And a lot of them are very intimidated because it seems very male dominated. Um, and and it's, it's such a, that's such a tough, layered question to answer in so many ways. I mean, in two ways. One, we look out in this audience. I, I like half of them are women. First off, represent. Yeah, yeah, ladies game. Hell yeah. Um, so I feel like that's um, slowly coming out of that trend. Secondly, it. I then want to address all of our boys out there, all of our men, because there is a, a little bit of onus on you to realize that it can be intimidating to have a lady come into your, if you're a woman trying to come into this. So if you are at a gaming store and you know someone, a woman joins your group, then just be welcoming, realize that that's not necessarily easy to do and it does take a lot of balls to walk in there and just kind of be, be open and accepting. I think so much about D&D is about being opening and accepting because you don't want to sit down at a table where you feel like you're going to be judged, you know? And on that point too, and this is my, my last other note to make on this, if you do feel there's conflict or something in the game that's bothering you as a player, if you play for a few games and it's not clicking or a player is acting in a way that you feel is preventing you from really enjoying the experience, don't be afraid to talk to them about it after the game. I wouldn't say throw down in the middle of the role-playing game session because it just tends to lead to heightened emotions and conflict, but like talk to the dungeon master afterward or talk to that player or both and just be like, hey, just wanted to ask, you know, the way this is going, I'm not feeling like it's really letting me, you know, play my character or the story is hindering me from really enjoying this. Is there a way that we can work towards changing or making it better for all of us together? And uh, most people will be happy to. They just weren't aware that there was a conflict of that type of circumstance. Uh, and if they aren't willing to, maybe you can find another gaming group. Um, yeah, those, those are my biggest suggestions. Super helpful. So I know that you're all bursting to ask your questions. Uh, Wonder Woman is our roving mic tonight, which is just a really fun thing to say. So put your hand up if you do have a question and Wonder Woman might choose you. 
Come on, Wonder Woman. I choo 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 is Pick the person. Some great NPC character voices. Any chance of an Australian one? <laughs> when I get comfortable enough with the dialect to not embarrass myself in front of all of you, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, as a performer, I'm always working on different dialects and accents, and the Australian is one that I've only in recent years been really trying to take a crack at, and I'm not quite comfortable yet to go all in with a character in that regard. Can we try not to be offensive? Try. And if this I, is some try. And if I do it and it sounds awful, it's only because it's a fantasy world where there aren't actually Australians. It's its own unique dialect that might loosely at times sound sort of Australian, but it's my world, whatever. <laughs> question. Got another one over here. Hi, Matt. Um, got a question about uh, foreshadowing story hooks and villain progression. So, I want to know, without giving too much spoilers away, and I won't mind if you choose not to answer this, but back in the pre-stream when the group fought Brimsythe, was there anything they would have encountered that would have stopped Thordak from returning? I mean, there were things that were happening during that time period parallel to their progression in the story that they could have totally mucked up what eventually became the releasing of Thordak, but that would have been a very, very far arc out of the path they were taken, and um, they didn't have the necessary magical ability at the time, nor the really or player know-how or knowledge, to know to pursue that thread. As far as they knew, Brimsythe was a singular entity, and the what brief hint they had of the rest of the Chroma Conclave with the other Obsidian Spheres in his lair uh, it was more like a, oh, that's not good. Let's not go there ever again. Slowly step out and let's say that never happened. Yeah, yeah, no, we basically, there were evil eyeballs in a bunch of crystal-y orbs and they were like, we saw what we, you just did, we're coming for you. And we were like, well, that's ominous. <laughs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> and we're like, have no context for that and kind of just kept going. Yeah. <laughs> we, I think we all had that moment where we were like, man, this is going to come back to haunt us. Moving on. Yeah, I mean, this time for the Winter's Crest Festival, you guys. High five, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they had more pressing matters at the time. So, I mean, it, it may have been possible, but it would have been a very, very extraneous long shot to discover all those story elements. And even so, the entities that were involved would have probably sneezed and killed them all if they had stepped. Like Raishan, who was partially responsible for that, would have just turning on, oh, that's adorable. <laughs> that bitch and is mine. All that bitch is mine. That bitch is mine. Right, Sean. Another, <laughs> another question over here. Hey, guys. Uh, huge fan. And uh, I've uh, watched all your videos all the time. Awesome. And one of the videos that I watched was uh, with Vin Diesel with the large witcher. Oh, what? Yes. Who's witcher that? <laughs> I just um, want to ask you a question, a DM and a player myself. Was it awkward or was it funny moments when you're trying to DM for Vin Diesel himself? <laughs> <laughs> well, first off, that was one of the weirdest phone calls I've ever gotten in my life, was Dan Casey from Nerdist, three days before it happened, going, hey, Matt, so uh, you want to come on Monday and Dungeon Master for Vin Diesel? I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like... Life's weird enough in LA where conversations like that, there is always a chance of truth even if someone's messing with you. So I was like, uh, what, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, totally. I'm like, all right, cool. All right, how long are we gonna play? He's like, we have about two hours of gameplay time. I'm like, all right, I'll prepare about two hours of story. It'll be great. They built a whole set over the weekend. They show up Monday. I get a, a call the morning of, and Dan Casey's like, hey, so Vin Diesel's time is kind of cut a little short, so we can only really play for an hour. I'm like, okay, so I have to condense two hours of story of the time into an hour. We can do this. We can do this. And then and they, they were like, oh yeah, by the way, we actually want to do a PR Q&A with Vin Diesel for like the last 20 minutes. So you really only have about 40 minutes. Which they then cut down to 25. Which they then cut down to 25. So I condensed two hours of story in 25 minutes. No pressure. Um, but at the same time, when you have somebody on that level of like multi-international stardom as Vin Diesel, there's like an 80 to 90% chance they're going to be a complete asshole. It's just how it works sometimes. 
So I was really worried. I was really worried. And he showed up, and we finally got a chance to talk, and we like go over the story and his character for about 10, 15 minutes. And he was the coolest, chillest dude ever. He, he was, was like, so oh. nervous. He was like, I'm so excited. I haven't played in a while, and I hope I do okay. I like the idea of the character. Okay, cool, we can do that. Oh, man, I'm really excited. Thanks for having me on. He was just like a very, very cool guy. I was super excited. And uh, he was a little rusty at first, and you see him kind of, as you watch the video, he kind of has to get into it. It takes a few minutes. But it, as soon as he rolls that first natural 20, he turns into a big eight-year-old. And he's like, yeah, critical! That was when I knew we had him. I was like, we got this. We got this. Jesus. You were just talking into your wife, weren't you? No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. You were talking into your wife. No, that didn't happen in front of a bunch of people. Uh, (laughs) Shut the fuck up. (laughs) I'm so glad we were all here to witness that. Intimidating, but ultimately a lot of fun. We've just got another question here as well. Yeah. Hi guys, um, this kind of ties into the whole making a character that you're comfortable with. How much of your personality goes into making your characters, and do you, Matt, how much of the personality drives the stories you create? Um, I, it's hard not to put an element of your personality in every character you play because they're your character and it, each represents kind of a facet of your personality, some that maybe don't get explored as often or that you don't have the opportunity to. Even evil campaigns, you can make a terrible character, but there's a part of your id that's in that character. You want, you want to play the story because you don't have the opportunity to express these you know, darker elements of your persona, so this is your chance to do so. Um, so, it's hard not to put yourself into a character to a certain extent. Uh, I mean, technically, if we want to get all actory woo-woo on you for, for a hot second, um, Stan Vzlosky, the Stan Vzlosky method actually kind of works a little bit about like this, where you, you make a table, like a T-chart, and whenever you have a character, you write down all the things that you're alike with that, that character, and then all the things that you're not alike with that character. And the way Stan Vzlosky teaches it is, in the ways that you are similar, awesome. You don't have to act. And, and it's not a bad system because, I mean, I, I could be a, a mile apart from someone sitting next to me, but you're still gonna have something in common. Everyone has something in common somewhere. As far as like creating stories and world and NPCs, um, in the same way, a l- l- little bit of yourself, it's hard not to put into them. Um, stories a little more esoteric. I'm fascinated with things that are not like me, things that are different. I I find it a lot of fun to to kind of, especially as a dungeon master where you play so many characters, uh, the part of the fun of that, the thrill of that is being able to express so many different uh, things that are outside of your comfort zone. I really enjoy being able to step in and play female characters across the spectrum from like very, very powerful, strong uh, personalities to, you know, sly, dark, somewhat manipulative individuals, and then as far as dudes go, I get to play a range of, you know, dumb, grizzled, you know, outback farmers to uh, very, very intense politicians to all these different things that are not at all like me, except for little bits here and there. You find that that seed of truth is what you build on each time. Um, So yeah, but but for making characters, it's hard not to put a nugget of yourself in there, really. Got another question over here. So, you've got a backstory you said you've written for both Gilmore and Allura. God forbid anything happens to them because we love them. But would you post online their backstories for us to read? Perhaps one day. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's one of those things where um, when you're developing a world of this size, and it's a lot to develop, um, with a lot of expectation, a lot of eyes on it, there's, I have to find a fine line between revealing information that's already been revealed and things that are still behind closed doors. There are things that may, that probably shouldn't be revealed because the party won't know. And if I've learned anything and there's information online, everyone's going to tweet it at my players. I can be like, this is the thing that's happening, but don't tell the players within 12 hours. Like, hey Liam, look at this thing! <laughs> and of course the players are going to look. So like, I, I, I purposely keep a lot of things close to my chest because I wanted to be a surprise for the players and for the watchers. Yeah, by the by, if you uh, tag us in the tweet, it does mean we can see it. 
not a lot of people understand that concept. Yeah. Like, oh my god, I hate that episode. I hate watching that Marisha Ray's face. You're like, she sees that tweet. And I'd be like, dude. hey dude, and he's like, I didn't know. I didn't know you're, I'm a big, hi, hi. And I'm like, I, I'm. Let's see fan. that. Big fan, I love cues. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Like, dude, it's cool. Just don't put me in the tweet. <laughs> um, but yeah, I. I think eventually, like when this arc finishes and things are revealed, I'll probably do, and I'm talking about this a little bit, when, when, when Vox Machina's story ends, <laughs> um, do a big Q&A with like all the things that people didn't know and questions that I can't answer now because that part's over, I'll be happy to discuss. No, we, we want to, we've been planning as a group that whenever Vox Machina's story comes to the end, we want to have like at a tavern with some drinks and it's us like talking to St. Peter at the Pearly Gates and being like, all right, dude, so tell us this one time that the Beholder did this thing and could I have avoided it? And you just tell us all your secrets. I can't tell you all the secrets. I want all the secrets. Can't tell you all the secrets. All. Can't, can't tell you all the secrets. Yes. Not happening. Okay, moving on. We've got another question over here. Um, in any game, past or present, do you have a favorite trick or cursed item? I'm, I'm sorry, what? A favorite trick or cursed item. I mean, Craven Edge was a fun one. <laughs> no, it's necessarily cursed, but sentient weapons and sentient magical items are always an interesting dynamic. Bring another personality of power, a source of strong power in a game that also can decide whether or not it likes its wielder or can manipulate the wielder. It always makes for a fun game. Uh, that's a lot of fun. Uh, in Less of a magical item, but I like characters that can play with luck. It happened in our game. Uh, these hags, you know, dark fey creatures, these, these, these various hags could pluck elements of luck and fate from players as part of a trade. And I like that aspect of it. Well, it's not necessarily an item. That now character looms. Like, technically now, Vax is still indentured to one of those hags. The trade that he made for the poison that he isn't yet to use. Oh, I remember everything, guys. He I remember everything. that poison. Nope. What a dumbass. He's gonna die over that poison and he's not gonna even use it. Not my problem. Love you, Liam, if you watch this later. <laughs> so we've got another question over here. What's up, guys? Um, so we've got, we've had a whole year of this happening, so we've got great fan art, great fan fiction and stuff, so that, if this is being recorded, so that we know, what's the line of you going, hey, this is great, at wall, back up, I don't want that. Anything on Rule 34? <laughs> I will say, I'm very open, I'm very open to all sorts of fan fiction, fan art, even racy stuff like, we're in, we're in, we go to Burning Man, we're, we're cool, whatever floats your boat, it's fine. The entertainment industry, but, yeah. But when, when you stumble upon extremely graphic sexual fan fiction about the players, not the characters, I'll draw the line there. I forgot about that, yeah, yeah. And you know what, power to you, I guess, but that, that at least, that was a very awkward morning. <laughs> I think Talison read longer than anybody and was yeah, like, oh did. god, he oh was... god, I can't stop. Why? No. Uh. Yeah. No, it became like a test of willpower to see how long you could get through it. Yeah. I did what with... How many of us were in one... What? That was, Jesus. That was unique. Yeah, that was extreme. And yet at the same time, like, I guess achievement unlocked? I don't know. The saddest little... <laughs> Try and find this now. Oh. Yeah. Everyone. We may have just horribly embarrassed some poor Tumblr writer, and I'm so sorry if we, we did. We love you. You're great. Just, we love your appreciation. It just you know, it more caught us off guard. Yeah. Was yeah. expecting that. <laughs> We've got another question if you'd like it. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew Mercer. Yes? Matthew Mercer. I'm sure this has never happened to you. Such a great DM. But let's say you wake up one day, 20 minutes Where are you again. going with this? <laughs> there is a point. I'm sorry, realizing. this has never happened to me. I'm so embarrassed. Keep going. 20 minutes of the game, you've got nothing prepared. What do you do? 20 minutes of the game, nothing prepared? Nothing prepared. Write down a bunch of names? 
and just see where it goes. One of the one of the things that'll that'll hold you up for any game, situation wise, is having to create NPC names, in my opinion. And nothing will take the players out of a, a deep fantasy story more than being like, oh, you encounter George. David the Knight, or Steve the Stable Master. You know, yeah, Steve Steve's been in a lot of your guys' games and mine too. Steve gets around the table, so like. The rest of it you can bullshit as much as you want, but having those that list of names is so helpful because it, you can just say like, oh yeah, you want to do a half fork name? Pervon. <laughs> Pervon as a singular phrase. Pervon. <laughs> That's an actual name? And all the people out there whose name is Pravon, who watch the show, hate all of you now. But I love you, Pravon. We've got another question up here, if, unless you want to continue. Uh, no. I'll just say, just to finish it real fast, once you have those names down, the rest of it, you can bullshit all you want, and make up whatever happens. But that, to me, has always been kind of what can really sell a story you're making up or not, is to have those names in the go, any NPCs they encounter like that. Monsters, you can make up stats in the go if you want to, you can just see how the dice roll, like, oh yeah, that seems like that should hit, or up oh, that missed, or, you know, oh, you find a crystal that hums and whispers the phrase Golden Girls over and over again. What, what does that mean? Let's find out, you know? You can make up whatever you want, but the names make it easier Monday, to get there. Tuesday, Happy Days, whoa, holy shit, this is tough. It's a great module, by the way, the Happy Days module, yeah. highly recommended. What was the, the, the book we found in the, the store, the games, we had Game Empire, and it was like the GM's, it was like called GM's Gems or something like that. Yeah, it was a cool book called GM, uh, GM's Gems that has just a bunch of resources for game masters that have uh, tips and tricks on NPC creation, world building, magical item development, and a bunch of examples you can pull from that as well. It's, it's yeah, it cool had list. like a list of names, it had a list of like NPC quirky hooks. You know, like, uh, it has one eye and an, an eye patch and has a limp. You know, like, so that you can just kind of look quickly and be like, this is an interesting person that I totally yeah. thought about. So if you have 20 minutes, you can go there and be like, uh, uh, sh sh all right, they're in a small bog and uh, they discover that giant rats have become sentient and uh, have begun stealing children in the night to mutate them into... Horned rat gods. It's like cool. the mad Game list set. of D and D. So we've yes. got another question up here. Yes. Uh, get it, guys. Um, one thing I've noticed with Matt saying a lot of the telltale things like Matt will remember. Will remember this? Yeah. yeah. What are the chances of actually getting a critical role telltale game? And if it was in the works, would it be a pre-season one? A post-season one, or would it be? Would it follow an NPC? Uh, I mean, I'd love that. That would be awesome. I, I, I think when when their licenses involve Minecraft and Batman, Batman. our lowly D and D Walking game dead. isn't quite going to call their attention yet. <laughs> one can dream. Uh, yeah, I mean, we we know a lot of the Telltale guys too, and but they, yeah. They're doing their own thing I mean, right now. Between Minecraft and Batman and the Borderlands, like most of our party has worked with some Telltale, with Telltale to some degree. Yeah. But uh, but it's also you know their interest. If they came to us and wanted to make one, hell yeah, hell yeah, all over that. So what I'm saying is, you all should bombard Telltale to make a critical role game and just let them know that there's interest. Um, no, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> don't do that. That, comes, that can come across as a little. Let's just say. There are things being worked on. It's That's way too vague. <laughs> I can't say anymore. NDAs and shit. We have no idea. We would love one day to, to create something like that. Um, We're working on it, man. We're trying to, to, to find ways to expand the media. But and I, I do want to preface all of this with when you guys watch Critical Role, we are pretty much 100% self-produced. We work uh, with our producers at Geek and Sundry, um, but they are also producing everything else. So we're, we're very self-run. So um, when you see the fan art galleries in Break, Liam does that. 
you know, when we when we do the 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 pre-show announcements, I do that. Yeah, like that's all stuff that we wrangle. We self-produced our our opening title video. You know, yeah. so it's very it's just us. You know, we're working as fast as we can. Yeah. I think we've got time for one more question. We've, we've actually been given a few moments more to ask some more questions. <laughs> you do? Say, hey, lovely. Yeah, you guys, you guys are special. We love you. Okay, we've got a question here. Instant, please. Um, I was just wondering if you could do the Gollum voice. Something about the Gollum voice? Yeah, just wondering if you could do the Gollum voice. If I, if go, Matt, go. Well, Liam could do it a lot better because he actually does Gollum, Gollum. before the games. But uh, I can definitely, let me see. Don't you learn my love, my precious Gollum, Gollum, no, you want to give it to us, please? No, you're a thief, a liar, no, no, not listening, not listening, murder, no, go away. <laughs> Over here. <laughs> I do not need your mic. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering, um, in Vox Machina, a lot of the characters multi-class for story purposes, but Keyleth is one of the characters I don't see multi-classing. So if you could, what would you be and why? If I if I multi-classed into anything. Um, so full disclosure, I actually debated heavily about multi-classing for, with Keyleth for a hot second. But I am a little torn, because it, uh, honestly, I'm still kind of going with the flow of the character. None of us know what's going on, and we're, we're all riding by the seat of our pants with this one. So, like, I, you guys know about as much of Keyleth's future as I do. Um, because we're, we're allowing ourselves to be affected by the story elements, so it'd be, I mean, and, it'd be stupid if I was like, no, I mean, this is gonna be my future. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have an Oscar in five years. <laughs> you know, like, like that type of a thing. So we try not to do that because the world changes you. Um, so I, I did debate for a hot second when Keyleth was kind of really getting, she was very angry. She's pulling out of her anger phase. Um, but when she was like, so upset at the way the world had become and that she'd been lied to. She felt like she'd been lied to. Um, so there was a hot second that I actually debated about throwing a point of barbarian into her. Yeah. Uh, Man, raging and wild shape is no and wild joke. Shape. Yeah, yeah. That is no joke. So I, I thought about, um, and it was actually, I thought about it. I'll tell you the moment that I thought about it. And it was after the fire Ashari had gotten wiped out. And, and I leveled shortly after the fire Ashari got wiped out. And uh, then there was like the few times at like Whitestone where I started using my uh, Firestorm spell. And I was describing it as very like, Keyleth is enraged. She's enraged and angry and you know, she's, and she's crying and she's like casting these fire spells. And so that was the moment after the fire Ashari was wiped out that I heavily debated it, but it, it is tough because Keyleth's whole overarching journey is to try and become the arch druid and, and be the salvation to her people. So, yeah. We've got another quick voice request over here. Dance this is monkey. Dance, right? Dance monkey. About your character, McCree, what's the time? I just like indulging anticipation. I'm just enjoying Overwatch like a happy person. It's high Someone call the Undertaker. We've got our final question. Okay. Um, some of my hi. Hi. Some of my um, Marisha. Yeah. 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 Hi. 
Some of my favourite moments in Critical Role have been the character interactions, whether it's between the player characters or between like the MC. I think my favourite to date is um, Gilmore and Keyleth teleporting to find a very naked Max. <laughs> And just that reaction. There's been a lot of player nudity in recent games. It's just it's been a theme recently. I'm like, okay. You know, I think say, everybody right. is okay with this. Hey, body pride. All right, be oh, comfortable with yourself. There's nothing wrong with it. No body shaming. No, there's nothing. I'm not shaming anything. It's just, it's just, just a trend. Free the nipple. <laughs> it's the trend that started happening more often. Recently. I was like, oh, all righty. Anyway, your Dragons question. are destroying the world. Do you think we give a shit about seeing each other's titties? No! Why, 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 why are you yelling at me? I think it's great! I was just acknowledging it! What's your question? Yeah, my question is, yeah. um, you know, is that something, you know, that, that interaction between yourselves, between, like, the player characters, between the NPCs, is that something you actively, um, try to foster? Is that something that's just kind of come about, like, over the years? Like as you've been playing, or is that something you kind of go, oh, I really want to kind of, you know, go for these cute moments, go for these sad, scary moments between all of you, that, so it's not just co combat, or is it just kind of, oh, it's just happened this way, this is great. I think it's not so much that everyone's trying to shoot for sad moments, or happy moments, or levity. Um, we're all performers, and we all love storytelling and narrative primarily, that's our career, that's what drew us into it. So while all the players and myself enjoy, you know, the strategy and the difficulty of battle, and that's a very big part of the game for us at the same time, it's as important, if not slightly more so, is the narrative and the character interactions for us. Um, nobody really plans moments, per se, because no one knows what's going to happen. Even me, I can't tell you how many games I've prepared sheets and then we only get that far into it. Or we skip all this and go right to here. So I don't know what they're going to do either. I think all these moments that you see and part of what makes the show so interesting for all you guys and us is no one knows what's going to happen and all those moments happen organically and yeah, you're you're experiencing it with us which I, I think like you said is why it's so engaging when there's a huge plot line reveal you like we are reacting with you guys yeah it's 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 that kind of and for us the thrill is for me knowing what's going to come dropping it and seeing how the players react and take it and in many cases taking it in directions I don't expect, and, uh, and that's really cool for me too. So I don't think anyone plans specifically, except for maybe Sam. Sam plays the long con. I know he plan, he'll plan moments to, to happen a ways away and then find the way to drop it. So if anyone, he's the one that kind of does plot on his own for a bit, but other than that, I think most everyone is playing pretty much reactionary to whatever is occurring in the game, and that's kind of thrilling. Yeah, I mean, I think the only time that I've really so, like the Gilmore thing that was totally circumstantial, you know, that just worked out the way it worked out. Um, the only times that I try and think about moments or conversations that I know what I want to have, generally there's still a result of reaction. There's still a result of, well, this happened, so I know I want to have this conversation. So like in last, not last episode, but the episode before talking with Pike, like I knew I wanted, that Keyleth wanted to talk to Pike about the religion aspect before they left. And then um, uh, even Keyleth and Kima had like butted heads early on. And that was totally reactionary because Keyleth did not tr trust Kima. But after that, Keyleth felt a little bad. So there were apologies later. That was thought about, but not necessarily much more beyond I know I want to apologize, or I know I want to talk to Pike. And that's kind of as far as we go. Good question. Okay, so we don't have any more questions left to ask. Do, but does anyone like singing? Do you guys know that there's By a reason chance? this weekend is special other than Haven? And uh, it's Matt's birthday this weekend. <laughs> So, I'm going to point this mic at you guys. None of us want to sing into the mic. None of you want us to sing into the mic. And we're going to do a very extra special happy birthday chorus. Now, we've also got a bit of a, a special group of singers joining us tonight. 
you may recognise their voices and if you peek around the corner onto the video screens, if you can, you might be able to see them. But let's get started with Happy Great. Birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Happy Birthday to you. Amazing guests at the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants cake? Yeah, it's cake time. 